Yeah, yeah I would like to, uh, you know, send our condolences to the Siler family. Um, one of the first people I met when I got here in school was um, Sonny Siler and his family, and the, obviously the obvious meaning that they've had to the University of Georgia and um, the UGA Dog Nation family. They've been incredible. So um, we're all mourning the loss of him and, uh, and just thoughts with his family uh, during this tough, tough time. Questions? Kirby, in terms of what you look for in the game, and I know you're out there to win the game first and foremost, that's the game plan, that's where you're at, but are there other things in a first game that you evaluate, just some staples or some structure you can give us just for what coach looked for? for I think procedurally, you, know, you haven't had the play clock permanently on. You have it at practice, it's not the same. Um, I think uh, discipline for onsides and, and, and cadence, uh, you know, the little things that usually get you beat turnovers. I mean, the, the first game is no different than the last game in terms of the things that will get you beat. But I do think uh, first game jitters exist and uh, you want the players to be able to get comfortable and uh, go out and cut loose and play and get the, get the anxiety out of the way, get the first hit out of the way. And uh, I want to play, you know, our brand of football and, and play really disciplined and not have a lot of penalties and a lot of sloppy mistakes. You know, communication things, things that we just beat yourself for trying to avoid. Kirby, a couple days into the week, uh, what have Dejan and Kendall been able to do to, to this point of the week? Uh, they've both done more. Dejan stayed in a black. Uh, Kendall's been out of a black. Uh, they both are, uh, I mean, they look good. We're giving a lot of reps to a lot of other guys because we got other guys to get prepared for, but. Um, they've both been in Indy, they've both done drills, uh, they both worked um, you know, during the run periods and the pass periods, so I feel good about both of them. Coach, at what point during camp or during the preseason leading up, do you kind of feel the sense that these guys are kind of tired of practicing against each other, it's time to play somebody else? Well, with the way things are now, I mean, you could feel that way in spring, you could feel that way in the summer. I mean, we, we do so many, uh, glorified walkthroughs. Uh, we try to change it up and break up the monotony, but I can't pinpoint a day per se, because I think that you have to uh, be willing to go against each other and not let it become monotony. And like I told everybody, I, I told them today, I said, that one rep of inside zone that you take today has to be the greatest rep of inside zone you've ever taken. That one stunt step you take as a D lineman has to be the, the best one you've ever taken. And uh, you don't, Repetition is the mother of all skill, and you've got to get a lot of reps to get good at it. Yeah, this being Julian Humphrey's second year in the program, what have you seen from him in terms of how he's grown and how he's gotten a better approach this season? Yeah, I think Fran's done a tremendous job with Julian. He's a, a, a fast guy that came in, kind of raw uh, talent, um, had not played. Um, a lot of the techniques that we're teaching in terms of, uh, you know, multiple coverages. He played a lot of man, and uh, he's grown as a player. He's gotten tougher. He's gotten more physical. He still has not arrived. Um, he still has, you know, moments that make you wonder what he's doing. Then he has, you know, wild moments. He's made some really good plays in camp, but he has to continue to play in and, and kind of buy into the process of getting better at that position, and, and he'll get better because he's, he's talented. Coach, when we spoke to Coach Shimmy, he talked about installing with volume, starting with you know volume with, with the defense. Is, with young players, you talked about Julian maybe learning the playbook a little bit more. Is there ever a talent overweighs the knowledge of the playbook where we just put them out there maybe simplify things? Well, I think to simplify things, uh, it takes away a little bit of our advantage, and um, you know we don't have to simplify things because we've got players with experience. Uh, we're good teachers. Um, we had two freshmen last year that were talented enough and smart enough to walk out there and start a third by the end of the year with Jalen Walker. So uh, between Michael, Jalen, and, and Malachi, we've proven that we can play with freshmen and have volume. Um, so we don't look at it as we have to give up one to get the other. We're going to do all we can to help people have roles and learn and, and put the best people out there and give us a chance to win. We'll have a chance to talk to Zion in a little bit. Just uh, what kind of progress have you seen from him and, and the value of having a defensive lineman like him with the kind of experience he has? Well, he creates uh, a lot of value in the locker room. Uh, he's a lunch bell guy. He carries his lunch bell every day to work, and he gives you an honest day's work every day. 
Uh, he, he competes. He covers down. <clears throat> covers down. He's always one of the hardest guys <coughs> when they throw the ball. He breaks and covers down. Um, so uh, when you've been in this program as long as he is, there's there's a lot of work that he's done that uh, we certainly appreciate as a staff because he, he buys into the hard work. Yeah, follow up on that. You've got Zion, mm -hmm. Tremel, uh, all these guys that have played so much football. Just how unique is it having that many guys that have played as many, much football as they have? And how valuable are they in terms of setting the standard for those younger guys like Kristen Miller, Jordan Hall, uh, guys like that through ball camp? Yeah, that's what they do. They set the standard. And uh, we challenge them this week to, to set the standard for a game week of practice. And those guys do that. They, they set an example. They're able to, in like, they're able to carry the weight and show guys how it's supposed to be done because they have a uh, unique spot because they've been part of, uh, of a lot of success. So they carry the weight and they show those guys how to practice and what to do to get better. And they've, they've all kind of become products of that because none of those guys were immediate success stories upon arrival. They, they kind of had to earn it. Coach, have you determined yet uh, you know, how big your roster will be for this day? I guess you, you're unlimited, right, on, on a game like this. Will you be 80 or 100? And then kind of on that, uh, you have such a big wide receiver core and it seems talented and deep. Does that, where do you like to shave down to in terms of having a rotation of, of kind of regulars in there? I don't know. I, th I feel like we're thin at wide out. Everybody keeps talking about this wide receiver core. I'm like, we are thin. Um, we just don't have – enough uh, depth there. We don't have enough guys in our two deep to finish practice and um, and so it makes it tough. Um, we got guys dinged up, um, guys injured, so it makes it a little bit harder. But um, I, I don't know that you have a rotation. I mean, uh, the year LSU won the National Championship, I think 95% of the snaps were three receivers and there were three really good receivers. Uh, so, you know, the, you play the players that give you a chance to play. We have a, a, a bar and we say this is winning football above it and this is losing football below it. And if you can play winning football, then we're going to give you opportunities and chances to play based on what you have shown us. And uh, we got some guys that can play winning football. We've probably got six or seven. We've probably got three or four that are right on the line that, that aren't playing winning football yet that we're going to try to get ready. So um, that's the hope. Overall dress out? Yeah. Oh, overall dress out. I, I, we hadn't really talked. I mean, I can dress the entire roster if I want to. I mean, it's just going to be a matter of deciding how much room we have um, on the sideline. Um, you know, we'll have some other games that we have an opportunity to dress those guys for. We try to reward everybody by dressing at least one during the year. Um, typically, we do the guys that came to camp because they've been through the most practices and then try to get the guys that came out when school came later. Kirby, you mentioned Trey Scott getting his start at UT Martin, obviously had stops at North Carolina and Ole Miss briefly before he got here. What was it that attracted you to him, and, and how have you seen him grow and develop as a coach in his, I guess, seven seasons now? Well, the first thing that attracted me to, to me to him was Pete Jenkins, who is the father all right over there. <laughs> <laughs> the father of all uh, D-line coaches. One of you should go do a, a special on Pete Jenkins, but he is – uh, 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 what's the right word? He is, an, uh, I don't want to call him a dinosaur, but he is one <laughs> of the kind. He has been through every SEC school, maybe but Georgia. He is the father of at least 120 defensive line coaches. Trey would tell you that he uh, helped develop him, and when we needed a defensive line coach, we called Pete and said, Pete, give us somebody in your tree, and tell us where the best young one is, and uh, we want him to develop here at a really great university, and, uh, and, and Pete talked about Trey, and I think Trey at the time had just gone to maybe to Ole Miss, and uh, we hired him, but he had a background that, that started at UT Martin, like we all did, and uh, he played back in the Division II Gulf South Conference days over in, in Arkansas, and uh, I had some history there, so I had a lot of respect for the way Trey had worked his way up and earned it, and uh, he's done nothing but the same here. Kirby, I'm doing a story on the idea of halftime adjustments. I've talked to a few coaches. And I know that 2017 you had a couple games that kind of broke different ways at halftime. But what's been your experience with Is it kind of an overused term? Or how, how much can you actually do at that point? Yeah, uh, I would think it is an overused term. I think it's more important now than it's ever been with the uh, – advent of the offense. Um, there's so much volume of offense out there that 
by a half, you know, you, you feel like you have an understanding of where they're trying to attack you and what they're trying to do. So you obviously get more time to go in and adjust at halftime. Back in the days of, let's call it 20, 2008, 2010, 2012, you know, it wasn't like that. There, there wasn't that same, uh, there was a physicality to the game that's probably unseen now from direct runs and people playing in a phone booth. And there was a little less adjusting you could do to that. You, you, could, you could tweak some things, but now uh, there's alternatives. And there's a lot more offense out there. Every offensive play has three plays on it. So defenses have to find ways to be creative, to create an advantage. And uh, you know I think there's a lot more strategy now. Some offenses hold things for the second half. Some defenses hold things for the second half. And I've been always a big believer, if it's good enough to use it, you better use it in the first half. Uh, and not save it for the second, but we try to do a good job of doing that. And you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But it has a lot to do with the players, not the not the adjustments. Trevor, you mentioned about studying the All Blacks, and I think I, I heard you say about you know you grew up watching Jordan and the Bulls. Have you looked at teams that have repeated in other sports to learn about some of the traits that help them succeed? No, I have not. Um, not that I know of. I don't, I, don't, I don't think that we have. We really haven't studied anybody that that, that repeated. And All Blacks was more about being winning, winning as organization. I don't know. I mean, I would assume if they were winning as organization, they probably repeated. But I don't even know if they have. Um, like I said, that's each and every year is independent of the previous, and, and there's nothing about the other two that's going to help us or hurt us in this season. It's completely independent, just as last year was, and we've kept it that way. We focused on this year. Our team is, I don't know, 80% new from the one, two years ago. So it's a new group. Kirby, over the off season, we asked a lot about Chaz Chandler stepping up and young guys. I mean, where is George at as far as replacing Nolan? And I know Nolan was more than just a position. I understand the leadership and the buying you brought, but. Can you go a little bit more in depth in terms of some of the things you said you might do differently without a guy like Nolan over there to generate bus? We're not doing a whole lot different. I mean, Nolan, God bless him, he, he was not as productive as you might make him seem. You know, a first round pick would probably usually have more production than he had, but he, he, uh, he was a really tough physical run player. Um, he was great at knowing whether it was run pass. Uh, he sacrificed a lot of rushes to break the pocket and get quarterbacks out of there and, um, and try to create uh, scrambles. So he did a lot of really good three things, so we have to replace him. But he was not exactly just a huge sack producer because he didn't have a lot of sacks as a junior and then his senior year, obviously, he got injured. Um, so who's going to replace Nolan? Well, a group of people are. Um, and when I say a group of people, it's by committee. We've got guys that go in on third down and give us similar rush to he, that he does. We've got guys that play on first and second that give a similar run uh, value that he gave us in terms of toughness and closing and scraping and, and effort and energy. And he was probably the most valuable special team. You know, he made tackles on kickoff. He blocked a punt. So you don't replace him with one guy. Uh, you replace him with a lot of guys. Kirby, uh, Drew Camp, one of your former teammates, and Athens are and of your kids, I think grew up as his kids. Um, one of his sons returns to play for UT Martin. Just kind of talk about your relationship with him, with Cal, with Cal and his dad, and just their family in general. Yeah, I remember Drew here as a player. He was certainly a, uh, a really good player, and we were around the same age. Um, I don't remember his son as well. I remember when his son was uh, here locally and, and, and through and, and worked out and was kind of growing up, but got a lot of respect for their family. and. Um, and looking forward to having them, you know, come to San Francisco. I know it'll be special for them as a family to watch him, you know, play in that same stadium. Coach, I'm curious to hear your stance on how you think this offense has kind of changed over the years. How has Georgia offense changed over the last seven or eight years? Well, it's, I mean, we've all talked about it before, but you start with Nick Chubb and Sony, and you go to uh, George Pickens and, 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 and Brock Bowers and Darnell and, and, and the guys we've had out there, Kiaris. I mean, it's just kind of evolved over who we've been able to recruit. And um, I think that evolution is constant. And probably the biggest change is, is the spreading of the ball. And there's so many guys who've come out of a game last year and we have seven people who got receptions, eight people who got receptions. I just don't think you find a lot of teams in the country that are able to spread the ball around to that many people. And, Sometimes you don't control that. 
You know, it's it's uh it's controlled by what the defense does, which that can be a good thing and that can be a bad thing. If the defense is controlling where it goes, they're telling you where they want you to throw it. Uh, but that's usually the right decision. It's just if you have a guy that has to touch the ball, you got to try to find ways to do that as well. So I'm, I'm proud of the evolution of it and, and what they've done, but a lot of that has to do with you know, who the coordinators were. Yeah, Kirby, uh, two guys have played big roles for you guys on defense last year. Kamari Lasseter and Sean Munden have been dealing with foot injuries. How have they progressed this week, and how are they looking in terms of what they might be able to do? Guys on Saturday. Yeah, Smiles been dealing with a foot injury that, that was from the spring, and uh, he's done a really good job of that. And he's been practicing and looks great out there, and has done everything in practice this week. Um, and Kamari's looked good out there and, and done everything. He was dealing with a, a foot sprain, um, but he's practiced and done really well this week. Another guy coming off a foot injury, Dan Jackson, a guy that just gives you experience and depth. How is he looking? Is he close to 100 percent? Saturdays. Yeah, the foot injuries. Not he, he's been great. He's had no issues with the foot. He's had a hamstring from early in camp, but he he's practiced. I don't know if it was the last four days, five days. They all run together on me, but he's he's practiced since the the the, uh, the last scrimmage. I know that he's, he did he did low volume in the scrimmage, and he's picked up volume ever since. And uh, he's taking all his reps right now. I want to ask you about someone else on your staff and Todd Hartley. When you had the opening on the staff, what sort of stood out about him and convinced you to bring him on? Well, I had uh, I had tried to hire uh, Todd prior to that. Um, uh, I think the, the very after Coach Beamer left, I believe we tried to hire Todd at that time. But he was with Coach Rick, and he was at Miami, and uh, he chose to stay. And um, then I had a second chance to hire him when we had another opening. And, uh, he chose to come home. I, I knew him when, when I got the job here. He stayed for a couple of weeks or maybe a month home with me. And I, I'd known Todd for a long time. I had a lot of respect for him. And he's very detail oriented. He's a get it done guy. He knows the questions to ask uh, to get things done. And uh, you, when you give him an assignment, he, he does it really well. And he's got a bright future in coaching. And I'm certainly very thankful that we've, uh, we've got him on our, our team. Time for two more questions. Yeah, Coach, it seems like perennially y'all have three or four either current walk-ons or former walk-ons that are impacting your roster. I guess is that commonplace in, in Power 5 football? And if not, what's been the key to success to finding impact players basically you know, free? Our, our, our staff and our state is incredible. So our staff does great research. Uh, we leave no stone unturned. We don't just go recruit five-star guys. We, we go to high schools and visit and try to find out the intangibles of good football players and if they have interest in coming in our organization because your organization and culture is made up of just as many walk-ons as it is scholarship players and uh, I have a lot of respect for, for walk-ons and what they do and uh, I don't know relative to others because I just I don't have a way of researching that you know like when I look at a team's roster I don't know who's a walk-on and who's not so it's hard to identify that I do know that we've had success uh, nurturing those relationships and developing those players and you know, a lot of times they're, they're your smartest, toughest, and they do exactly what they're supposed to do, so you get good production out of them. And we, we're very blessed to be in a state where high school football's so good that you find guys that, that help you. Coach, I know you're always proud of you know, all your guys who want to play at the next level, but you find out a guy like Harris, you know, the next Titans is a free agent, they get a little bit extra buzz. Yeah, we uh, we announced that today in the uh, team meeting right before practice. I got text and. Uh, Kiaris texted me and uh, one of the guys at the Titans texted me and the whole team went nuts, man. Was, Kiaris was just ecstatic and I mean, who, who who better deserves that than a guy that went through two, three, four injuries. He was on the leadership uh, SEC committee and represented this university on every board you could be on and I stood up for the team and led and uh, just unbelievable leader and had all the cards stacked against him and he, he still overcame all that and made it on what is one of the toughest things to do in all sports uh, to make that 53-man roster, and he did. I'm really proud of him. Thank you. Thanks.